When I did the last episode of Archery Pop Shots covering Shogun 2 Total War, there were requests to cover Rome 2. With even more DLCs and a massive update that added family trees, made the tech and skill trees more visually intuitive, and other user interface changes that actually made the game bearable to me, this was the right time to come back to Rome 2. And what a rich world to explore again. Unfortunately, covering the history and context of archery in the entirety of Rome 2 would be enormous. That would be madness. Madness. This is Wrath of Sparta. This DLC campaign for Rome 2 takes us back to the classic period of ancient Greece. The Peloponnesian War pits the city-states of Greece against each other. Athens, Corinth, Thebes, and of course, Sparta. And while this period was dominated by hot light combat, the bow and arrow were just as well known and well recognized in history and legend. It's almost strange to imagine the Hellenic world and its ubiquitous use of heavy infantry. The Hopley days, armed with shield, sword and spear, fighting in the closely packed phalanx formation, yet struggled to picture where archery would fit in. At the same time, Greek heroes and legends were renowned for their archery skills. The deities Apollo and Artemis were associated with bows and the hunt. In the Iliad and the Odyssey, we see renowned bowmen such as Odysseus, famous for the feat of shooting through a dozen axe heads. Paris, Prince of Troy, used the bow in combat and slew the mighty Achilles with the arrow to the heel. In reality, unlike their Persian neighbours, the Greeks did not widely adopt the bow in their normal style of warfare. It could be said that hot blood combat was honourable, and death in melee was more beautiful than being killed by an arrow. Some sources and scholars attribute the low status of the bow and the archer to this idealism of war. This didn't mean that the bow was dismissed, it was a specialised weapon, albeit often relegated to the lower classes who could not afford the equipment to fight as a hoplite, instead fighting as light infantry alongside javelin throwers and slingers. The Athenians were known to have maintained a core of archers, and archers would see use in siege defence, though had less of a presence in open battle and few battles record significant contributions by archers. The bows used by the Greeks were simple, short self-bows. Later, illustrations of archers show them using a composite recurve bow, widely recognised as being imported from the Scythians, a nomadic people who fought from horseback. Greek bows could shoot over 250 metres, though they were more likely ranged with some accuracy at around 150 metres, and could shoot accurately and directly at 50 to 60 metres. Notably, records indicate that Greek archers were outranged by Persian archers, as was the case with Xenophon's 10,000, whose archers had to be protected in formation. While most of Greece largely did not adopt the bow in their military, the people of the island of Crete became specialised archers. Their skill with the bow was so renowned they were hired as mercenaries by Greek city-states, particularly Sparta, and their archers would be sought out centuries later by the Romans, and Cretan archers were present even up to the fall of Constantinople in 1453. The Wrath of Sparta mini-campaign focuses on Greece and the conflict between the major city-states of Sparta, Athenai, Corinthos and the Boeotian League. As with real life, the unit roster is greatly restricted to several different types of hoplites, along with support troops such as cavalry and missile infantry. The balance of power between the missile troops reflects their real life counterparts. Javelin throwers do a lot of damage, but have very short range and low ammunition. Slingers have the longest range, but don't do as much damage as archers, which are probably the main support unit in your hoplite army. You can rain arrows onto your enemy units, however, more so here than in the main campaign, the effect of archers is greatly mitigated by shields. Arrows simply bounce off the heavily armoured hoplites, though the light armoured hoplites will suffer more attrition damage over time. The real damage is in hitting the flanks and rear. With shields covering the front and left, only the armour value is used in calculating damage when shooting at exposed sides, and from these angles, units of archers can cause devastating damage, taking a unit of hoplites down to the last man in several volleys. 
This is the key to breaking the deadlock of hoplite combat. While the infantry hold the line, the archers run to the flanks. They are even more effective than cavalry, who are countered easily by armoured spearmen and are better suited to chasing down enemy ranged troops. That's assuming that your archers have already dealt with them. Having 3 to 4 units of archers adds a large amount of flexibility to your army, and I wouldn't dare march out without them. It should go without saying that this is probably not how archers were used historically. In Greek warfare, if archers were used at all, it was typically behind the infantry, or sometimes embedded with the formations and engaging in short distance sniping. As light troops, archers have the historical advantage of being able to outrun the heavy infantry, but alone they cannot defeat them. Running forward to flank was unlikely to be feasible, as that would require an overview of the battlefield and instantaneous commands that would be available to the player, but not a real life commander. It should be noted that historically, the Greeks did not deploy archers in massed formations. This style of warfare would be more commonly seen in the medieval times, especially with the English archers. As devastating as a volley of arrows would be, Greek armies were more devoted to infantry combat rather than investing resources into the highly specialized archers. The fate of the battle was determined by which phalanx broke first. Of course, this is total war, and we have the liberty of playing with historical units in ahistorical ways, and that's what makes the game fun. Unlike the original Rome, Rome 2 makes more of an effort to depict battles in realistic ways, and you might be surprised to learn that some of the smaller details are well researched. Taking a look at the archer's unit model, we see that the archer uses the simple wooden self bow with size and proportion close to what we see in the source material. The archer wears an arrow quiver on the left side, and this might pique your curiosity. Most archers are more familiar with bags and quivers worn on the right, but pulling arrows from a crossbody position would have been plausible. In fact, historians have identified that light Greek archers may have carried up to 200 arrows and shot at a rapid speed, up to 10 aim shots per minute. Some depictions also show archers carrying light shields. The Cretan archers appear as mercenaries. On paper, their bows have more range and do more damage than their regular counterparts. Their unit model features the Lenothorax armor, though this doesn't really help them in melee. They also seem to use composite bows, likely derived from the Scythian bows that appear from northern tribes. Cretan archers are able to make use of whistling arrows to damage morale and heavy shot to inflict more damage but the cost of range and accuracy. This is particularly devastating against the heavily armed hoplites, almost ignoring all armor. This isn't far from history. Sources make reference to long arrows with heavy arrowheads that could pierce through shields and armor, but only at very short distance. The animations are not very specific, but we can see that the game roughly shows a conventional Mediterranean grip with the first two or three fingers pulling the string back. The source material is rather ambiguous, depicting a Greek pinch draw or a Mediterranean draw of some variant. What is known from historical sources is that Greek archers drew the string to the chest, which is exactly what we see here. Drawing towards the ear or cheek, as many of us would know today, was more of a medieval development. Speaking of animations, Rome 2 has improved the fluidity of the shooting. For the most part, archers no longer hold onto the bow for extended lengths and instead execute the shot more cleanly. In general, missile units are more responsive, beginning their shooting cycles quicker on command and not being stuck on reload while one archer is out of position. Considering that the archer units are just one out of many in Rome too, the game does a reasonably good job of illustrating them in a battle environment, and they are fairly well balanced for gameplay purposes. If there's anything really missing from the Hellenic campaign, it's that Greek archers were also known to be mobile combatants, shooting from dealing positions and being more versatile instead of being static massed archers. It's interesting how a campaign that focuses on hoplite combat brings out the importance of archers and other missile troops. Without them, battles are long and drawn out, much like how ancient Greek battles actually were. By bringing in mobile missile troops, the player gets to outplay their opponents, risking their potent but vulnerable archers or slingers to cause havoc in enemy lines, thinning out enemy infantry and breaking morale. 
In fact, it wouldn't be unusual to see archers accumulate the most kills in campaign battles. They are the tilt factor in armies and can make all the difference in close matches. Of course, we should be wary that Greek armies did not shoot volley upon volley of arrows into the backs of enemy hoplite formations. That was simply not the Greek way. That brings us to the end of our first foray into the Rome 2 franchise. Should we look further? Post your thoughts in the comments below. This is New Sensei, as usual, shoot straight, aim for your best.